Put your hands together for Greg Pauly. Date stamp, time stamp, 
um, on this iNaturalist platform. So like, if you're like, I'm not that interested in biodiversity in LA, I'm interested in biodiversity in America. That's fine, there's observations. So one of the things that's like somewhat terrifying as a result of this work is that a huge number of our observations are actually non-native species. And all of these four species here, again, if I think about reptiles and amphibians, this frog, lizard, that, um, that gecko over there that's got a couple legs in her, and that little tiny snake, those are all things, those are all non-native species that are here in Southern California that we either documented for the first time being here in California as a result of citizen science, or that we're tracking like range expansion of these non-native species through citizen science. Um, and one of the fun things is that the people who help us, who make these observations, and actually participate in this project, those observations are so important for documenting these non-native species that we actually invite them to co-author publications in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. All those people who have their names in red, they actually went the entire scientific process from making observations through publishing in the peer-reviewed literature. So the, but the main one I want to talk about is I want to talk about this last one, which is the ability for this like relatively straightforward tool of like taking these photos to completely revolutionize the way that we do animal behavior in college research. And so what I'm going to talk about is using this crowdsourcing approach to study rare natural history events. And so when I'm talking about rare natural history events, I mean things that me as a scientist might only see a handful of times in my entire life, or maybe never, right? So what do you think might be examples of like things that scientists who study biodiversity may never get to see, maybe like really rare things? You can just like shout out a couple of times. Mating lizards. What's that? Mating lizards. You're like somebody knows too much here, which <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but mating anything, like how many times have you been on a hike and been like, whoa, there's, you know, species, there's two squirrels. Maybe squirrels isn't a good example. There's <laughs> squirrels all over the place. We're obviously not going to use rabbits as an example. Well, even that, like we know that they're having sex all the time. How many people here have seen rabbits, wild rabbits, not like rabbits in a cage, actually mating? Okay, I think I'm the only one. <laughs> I've seen it once, but only once. Um, so we're actually going to talk about yeah, we're going to talk about animals mating, and in particular we're going to talk about lizards mating. And not just any lizard, but the coolest lizard in the world. This is the southern alligator lizard. Um, this is a species that occurs from northern Baja California up into southern Washington. It is the most common species in urban areas in that region. Um, it's the most common species here in the LA area. This is just a, a map of observations from this Rascals project. You can see it's all over the place. Like literally, it is like within a one block radius of where we're at right now. There's some in the water. In the water. Oh, that's that's because some people don't like. They want to obscure their observations. Oh, they don't want like if this from their yard, they don't want to show people where exactly it is. But, um, and so yeah, it gets a little buffer. And so yes, they are not in the water, but they are in the Channel Islands. Um, so this is what alligator lizards when they're mating. This is kind of what it looks like. That's the male there. He's biting the female on the back of her head and her neck. And they'll be in this position for like maybe like two days. Wow. The actual act of mating only takes a couple of minutes. Um, but the male holds onto the female most likely because he wants to make sure that no other males come along and inseminate that female. So it's called mate party. And so we can just ask, like, okay, this is a super common species. Within its range, there are you know a dozen natural history museums, hundreds of universities, thousands of biologists. We must know a lot about its mating behavior. Right? It's like a really basic aspect of understanding the natural history of the species. We must know a ton. What do we actually know? There is a single paper that even talks about the mating biology of this particular species. It was published in 1972 by this guy, Steve Goldberg, who was a professor at Whittier College. And it turns out, I actually know Steve, he's still, he's still publishing. I asked Steve, I'm like, hey, so you saw like these lizards, you actually saw this three times. He's like, no, 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 I've never seen it at all. That was actually my students reported this. So he's never seen this either. So the one paper in the entirety of the scientific literature with three observations of when these have even been seen mating, those weren't even by this other researcher. I have also never seen this. I've seen rabbits having sex. I have not seen alligators having sex. So we might just want to ask, like, okay, can we crowdsource the study of mating behavior, right? So you're like, well, how do you do that? Well, what you do is you write, oh, yeah, can we basically just ask people all across this range to help us study this? So what you do is you just write blogs like this, <laughs> which we happen to time with Valentine's Day, so we're going to send out another blog in about 12 days. And we write things like, you know, dear Los Angeles, we need your photos of alligator lizard sex. And the opening paragraph was, happy Valentine's Day. Love is in the air, but for more species than just homo sapiens. I should point out, I, I wrote this. <laughs> well, you might be thinking of roses, chocolates, and a candle at dinner. Our local alligator lizards are devising their own romantic plans. Valentine's Day happens to be around the start of the alligator lizard breeding season in Southern California. And we need your help to study the breeding biology. 
And I know what you're all thinking, like, that guy's one heck of a writer. <laughs> <laughs> the Pulitzer Committee is clearly going to call any day now. Surprisingly, they haven't done it yet. I'm still waiting. We do this about every year in the springtime. This last year we were pretty direct. We wanted the photos of alligator and lizard sex. <laughs> Studying lizard love through citizen science in 2015. Everybody's favorite lizard love bites. Um, and so you might think, like, does this actually work? And the answer is, yeah, it works. We start getting observations sent to us, like this one from Valencia, of alligator lizards mating four feet off the ground in bushes. Um, here's some mating four feet off the ground in someone's backyard. Um, they're just like, whatever, we're just going to get it on the front lawn. Um, here's some on the sidewalk that's actually an occidental. Um, maybe someone appropriately in the gutter. This is an amazing photo from a courtyard of a Pasadena apartment complex. Sometimes you get photos that are a little bit harder to explain. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we've been doing this for four years, right? I have never seen this. Steve Goldberg has never seen this. How many observations do you think we're able to generate in four years through crowdsourcing? A dozen. Uh, a dozen. A couple hundred? You guys are soft study. Yeah, so a couple hundred is actually, that's a great, that's a great guess. Um, again, three records is all we know, and those three records are just from two counties, so we don't really understand anything across the range of the species. And you ask what we've done in four years of this, and we have 191 records just from Southern California. We have 26 records from the northern part of their range, so like Northern California, Oregon, and Southern Washington. And we have 27 records of a closely related species called the Northern Alligator Lizard, for which the entirety of the scientific record had a whopping four observations. So this is absolutely, this absolutely incredibly amazing data set generated over this very short period of time. And so, obviously if you have three observations, you can't do anything with that. But if you have 217 observations, you, can, you have a data set that's actually amenable to statistical analysis. And so we can ask things like variation across latitude, variation across elevation. We can look at variation from one year to the next, like how much of this is dependent upon local weather patterns. If you think, for example, that like their breeding behavior is dependent upon temperature, you might think that they breed earlier in urban areas than in more rural areas because you get urban heat island effects. And that's all stuff that we can now test now that we have this absolutely huge data set. And this data set will probably jump by something like 40 or 50 observations in the next three months, or this next, this coming year. So maybe you're like, okay, like I totally am on par with like this, like totally makes sense, this is great, but I'm not that into alligator lizards. And like, that's, you know, that's okay. We all make bad life decisions. <laughs> so maybe you're into some other species. These are just other examples of like mating behavior for species that this has like never been well documented in. Other species that you can easily get this from. Or maybe you're like, I'm not that into like mating behavior. I'm much more into like ecological questions, like predator-prey interactions. No big deal. Tons of photos coming in of like predator-prey interactions. Things that probably most of us in this room, biologists like myself and others, we don't get to see stuff like this very often. But you get these amazing observations through crowdsourcing. Um, this is another one of uh, instead of reptiles and amphibians eating stuff, this is stuff eating reptiles and amphibians. The coolest one here is up in the upper right hand corner. That is a non native spider called the brown window that showed up here in Southern California in 2004, from Southern Africa. And that's a brown window eating a juvenile native southern alligator lizard. So you can also get like cool observations of things like, you know, cool observations of things like non native species and assessing some of their. So the big point here is that, like this tool that we all kind of take for you know take take for granted, like this this phone, which we still for some reason call a phone, even though it's like a phone and the GPS and like the magical game system all at the same time. Just this simple device allows us to get at these absolutely unbelievable stack of questions that, in some cases, are helping us to confront some of the major global biodiversity threats that we're facing. Um, I am fortunate to be at the National Science Museum and be able to be surrounded by educators and scientists. Be able to help do this project, and so I'll just leave it on this slide there. <laughs>